After the seclusion of the celery she had lived in so long, the carol of happy birds fell on his dulled hearing, almost like a shout. Jumping off all his four legs at once, in the joy of living and the delight of spring without its cleaning, he pursued his way across the meadow till he reached the hedge on the further side. Hold up, said an elderly rabbit at the gap. Sixpence for the privilege of passing by the private road. He was bowled over in an instant by the impatient and contemptuous mole, who trotted along the side of the hedge, chaffing the other rabbits as they peeped hurriedly from their holes to see what the row was about. Onion sauce, onion sauce, he remarked jeeringly, and was gone before they could think of a thoroughly satisfactory reply. Then they all started grumbling at each other. How stupid you are. Why didn't you tell him? Well, why didn't you say? You might have reminded him, and so on, in the usual way. But of course it was then much too late, as is always the case. It all seemed too good to be true. Hither and thither through the meadows he rambled busily along the hedgerows, across the copses, finding everywhere birds building, flowers budding, leaves thrusting, everything happy and progressive and occupied. And instead of having an uneasy conscience pricking him and whispering, whitewash, he somehow could only feel how jolly it was to be the only idle dog among all these busy citizens. After all, the best part of a holiday is perhaps not so much to be resting yourself as to see all the other fellows busy working. He thought his happiness was complete when, as he meandered aimlessly along, suddenly he stopped by the edge of a full-fed river. Never in his life had he seen a river before. This sleek, sinuous, full-bodied animal chasing and chuckling, gripping things with a gurgle and leaving them with a laugh, to fling itself on fresh playmates that shook themselves free and were caught and held again. All was a shake and a shiver. Glints and gleams and sparkles rustle and swirl, chatter and bubble. The mole was bewitched, entranced, fascinated. By the side of the river he trotted as one trots when very small, by the side of a man who holds one spellbound by exciting stories. And when tired at last, he sat on the bank while the river still chattered on to him, a babbling procession of the best stories in the world, sent from the heart of the earth to be told at last to the insatiable sea. As he sat on the grass and looked across the river, a dark hole 
in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye. And dreamily he fell to considering what a nice, snug dwelling place it would make for an animal with few wants and fond of the bijou riverside residence, above flood level and remote from noise and dust. As he gazed, something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, vanished, then twinkled once more like a tiny star. But it could hardly be a star in such an unlikely situation, and it was too glistening and small for a glowworm. Then, as he looked, it winked at him, and so declared itself to be an eye, and a small face began to grow up round it, like a frame round a picture. A brown little face with whiskers, a grave, round face with the same twinkle in its eye that had first attracted his notice. Small, neat ears and thick, silky hair. It was the water in it. Then the two animals stood and regarded each other cautiously. Hello, Mole, said the water rat. Hello, rat, said the Mole. Would you like to come over, inquired the rat presently. Oh, it's all very well to talk, said the Mole, rather pettishly, he being new to a river and riverside life and its ways. The rat said nothing, but stooped and unfastened a rope and hauled on it, then lightly stepped into a little boat which the Mole had not observed. It was painted blue outside and white within, and was just the size for two animals, and the Mole's whole heart went out to it at once, even though he did not yet fully understand its uses. The Rat sculled smartly across and made fast, and he held up his forepaw as the Mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that, he said. Now then, step lively. And the Mole, to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated stern of a real boat. This has been a wonderful day, said he, as the rat shoved off and took to the skulls again. Do you know, I've never been in a boat before in all my life. What? cried the rat, open mouthed. Never been in a... You never... Well, what have you been doing then? Is it so nice as all that? asked the mole, shyly, though he was quite prepared to believe it as he leant back in the seat and surveyed the cushions, the oars, the rollocks, and all the fascinating fittings, and felt the boat sway lightly under him. Nice? It's the only thing, said the water rat solemnly, as he leant forward to his stroke. Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Simply messing, he went on dreamily, messing about in boats. Messing. Look ahead, rat, cried the mole suddenly. It was too late. The boat struck the bank full tilt. The dreamer, a joyous oarsman, lay on his back at the bottom of the boat, his heels in the air. About in boat, or with boats, the rat went on composedly, picking himself up with a pleasant laugh. In or out of them, it doesn't matter. Nothing seems really to matter. That's the charm of it. Whether you get away or whether you don't. Whether you arrive at your destination or whether you reach somewhere else, or whether you never get anywhere at all, you're always busy, and you never do anything in particular. And when you've done it, there's always something else to do, and you can do it if you like, but you'd much better not. Look here. If you've really nothing else on hand this morning, supposing we drop down the river together and have a long day of it. No waggled his toes from sheer happiness. 
spread his chest with a sigh of full contentment, and leaned back blissfully into the soft cushion. What a day I am said. Let us start at once. Hold hard a minute, then, said the rat. He looped the painter through a ring in his landing stage, climbed up into his hole above, and after a short interval reappeared, staggering under a fat wicker luncheon basket. Shove that under your feet, he observed to the mole, as he passed it down into the boat. They untied the painter and took the skulls again. What's inside it? asked the mole, wriggling with curiosity. There's cold chicken inside it, replied the rat briefly. Cold tongue, cold ham, cold beef, pickled gherkins, salad, French rolls, cress sandwiches, potted meat, ginger beer. Lemonade, soda water. Oh, stop! Stop! cried the mole in ecstasies. This is too much. You really think so? inquired the rat, seriously. It's only what I always take on these little excursions. And the other animals are always telling me that I'm a mean beast and cut it very fine. The mole never heard a word he was saying. Absorbed in the new life he was entering upon, Intoxicated with the sparkle, the ripple, the scents and the sounds and the sunlight, he trailed a paw in the water and dreamed long, waking dreams. The water rat, like the good little fellow he was, sculled steadily on and forbore to disturb him. I like your clothes awfully, old chap, he remarked after some half an hour or so had passed. I'm going to get a black velvet smoking suit myself one day, as soon as I can afford it. I beg your pardon, said the mole, pulling himself together with an effort. You must think me very rude, but all this is so new to me. No, so, this is a, a, a river. The river, corrected the rat. And you really live by the river? A jolly life. By it and with it and on it and in it, said the rat. It's brother and sister to me, and aunts and company and food and drink and, naturally, washing. It's my world, and I don't want any other. What it hasn't got is not worth having, and what it doesn't know is not worth knowing. Lord, the times we've had together. Whether in winter or summer, spring or autumn, it's always got its fun and its excitements. Floods are on in February, and my cellars and basement are brimming with drink. That's no good to me. And the brown water runs by my best bedroom window. Or again, when it all drops away and shows patches of mud that smells like plum cake, and the rushes and weed clog the channels. And I can potter about dry shod over most of the bed of it and find fresh food to eat, and things careless people have dropped out of boats. But isn't it a bit dull at times? No, ventured to ask. Just you and the river, and no one else to pass a word with. No one else to. Well, I mustn't be hard on you," said the rat with forbearance. "You're new to it, and of course you don't know. The bank is so crowded nowadays that many people are moving away altogether. Oh no, it isn't what it used to be at all." Otters, kingfishers, dab chicks, moorhens, all of them about all day long and always wanting you to do something. As if a fellow had no business of his own to attend to. What lies over there? asked the mole, waving a paw towards the background of woodland, with darkly framed water meadows on one side of the river. Oh, well, that's just the wild wood, said the rat, thoughtfully. We don't go there very much, we river bankers. Aren't they, uh, aren't they very nice people in there? Said the mole, a trifle nervously. Well, replied the rat, let me see. Squirrels are all right, and the rabbits, some of them, but rabbits are a mixed lot. And then there's Badger, of course. He lives right in the heart of it, wouldn't live anywhere else either if you paid him to do it. Dear old Badger, nobody interferes with him. <laughs> They'd better not he added significantly. Why? Who should interfere with him? asked the mole. 
Well, of course, there are others, explained the rat in a hesitating sort of way. Weasels and spirits of foxes and so on. They're all right in a way. I'm very good friends with them. Pass the time of day when we meet and all that. But they break out sometimes. There's no denying it. And then, well, you can't really trust them. And that's the fact. The Mole knew well that it is quite against animal etiquette to dwell on possible trouble ahead, or even to allude to it, so he dropped the subject. And beyond the wildwood again, he asked, where it's all blue and dim, and one sees what may be hills, or perhaps they meant, and something like the smoke of towns, or is it only cloud drift? Beyond the wild wood comes the wild world, said the rat, and that's something that doesn't matter, either to you or me. I've never been there, and I'm never going, nor you either. You've got any sense at all. Don't ever refer to it again, please. Now then, here's our backwater at last, where we're going to lunch. Leaving the main stream, they now passed into what seemed at first sight like a landlocked lake. Green turf sloped down to either edge. Brown, snaky tree roots gleamed below the surface of the quiet water, while ahead of them, the silvery shoulder and foamy tumble of a weir, arm in arm with a restless, dripping mill wheel that held up in its turn a grey gabled mill house, filled the air with a soothing murmur of sound, dull and smothery, yet with little clear voices speaking up cheerfully out of it at intervals. It was so very beautiful that the mole could only hold up both forepaws and gasp, Oh my! Oh my, oh my! The rat brought that boat alongside the bank, made her fast, helped the still awkward mole safely ashore, and swung out the luncheon basket. The mole begged as a favour to be allowed to unpack it all by himself, and the rat was very pleased to indulge him, and to sprawl full length on the grass and rest, while his excited friend shook out the tablecloth and spread it, took out all the mysterious packets one by one, and arranged their contents in due order, still gasping, Oh my! Oh my! at each fresh revelation. When all was ready, the rat said, Now, pitch in, old fellow. And the mole was indeed very glad to obey, for he had started his spring cleaning at a very early hour that morning, as people will do, and had not paused for bite or sup, and he had been through a very great deal since that distant time which now seemed so many days ago. "'What are you looking at?' said the rat presently, when the edge of their hunger was somewhat dulled, and the mole's eyes were able to wander off the tablecloth a little. "'I'm looking,' said the mole, "'at a streak of bubbles that I see travelling along the surface of the water. "'That's a thing that strikes me as funny.' "'Bubbles! Oh, ho said the rat cheerily and inviting sort of way. A broad glistening muzzle showed itself above the edge of the bank, and the otter hauled himself out and took the water from his coat. Greedy beggars, he observed, making for the provender. Why didn't you invite me, Ratty? This was an impromptu affair, explained the rat. By the way, my friend, Mr. Mole, Proud, I'm sure, said the otter, and the two animals were friends forthwith. Such a rumpus everywhere, continued the otter. All the world seems out on the river today. I came up this backwater to try and get a moment's peace, and then stumble upon you fellows. At least, I beg pardon, I don't exactly mean that, you know. There was a rustle behind them, proceeding from a hedge were in last year's leaves still flung thick. The stripy head, with high shoulders behind it, peered forth on him. Come on, old badger, shouted the rat. Badger trotted forward a pace or two, 
been granted. Hmm. Hmm. Company. He turned his back and disappeared from view. That's just the sort of fellow he is, observed the disappointed rat. Simply hates society. Now we shan't see any more of him today. Well, tell us who's out on the river. Goads out for one, replied the otter, in his brand new wager boat. New togs, new everything. Two animals looked at each other and laughed. <laughs> Once it was nothing but sailing, said the rat. Then he tired of that and took to punting. Nothing would please him but to punt all day and every day. It was mess messing in it. Last year it was houseboating. And we all had to go and stay with him in his houseboat and pretend we liked it. He was going to spend the rest of his life in a houseboat. But all the same, whatever he takes up, he gets tired of it and starts on something fresh. Such a good fellow, too, remarked the otter reflectively. But no stability, especially in a boat. From where they sat, they could get a glimpse of the main stream across the island that separated. And just then a wager boat dashed into view. The rower, oh, stout figure, splashing badly and rolling a good deal, but working its hardest. Rat stood up and hailed him. A toad, for it was he, shook his head and settled sternly to his work. He'll be out of that boat in a minute if he rolls like that, said the rat, sitting down again. Of course he will, chuckled the otter. Did I ever tell you a good story about Toad and the lock keeper? It happened this way. Toad! An errant mayfly swerved unsteadily athwart the current in the intoxicated fashion affected by young bloods of mayflies soon life. A swirl of water and a poop, and the mayfly was visible no more. That was the otter. The mole looked down. Voice was still in his ears, but the turf whereon he had sprawled was clearly vacant, not an otter to be seen as far as the distant horizon. But again there was a streak of bubbles on the surface of the river. The rat hummed a tune, and the mole recollected that animal etiquette forbade any sort of comment on the sudden disappearance of one's friends at any moment, any reason or no reason whatever. Well, well, said the rat, I suppose we ought to be moving. I wonder which one of us had better pack the luncheon basket. He did not speak as if he was frightfully eager for the treat. Oh, please let me, said the mole. So, of course, the rat let him. Packing the basket was not quite such pleasant work as unpacking the basket. It never is. But the mole was bent on enjoying everything. And although, just when he had got the basket packed and strapped up tightly, he saw a plate staring up at him from the grass, and when the job had been done again, the rat pointed out a fork, which anybody ought to have seen. And last of all, behold, the mustard pot, which he had been sitting on without knowing it. Still, somehow, the thing got finished at last, without much loss of temper. The afternoon sun was getting low as the rat sculled gently homewards in a dreamy mood, murmuring poetry things over to himself, not paying much attention to Mole. But the Mole was very full of lunch and self-satisfaction and pride, and already quite at home in the boat, so he thought, and was getting a bit restless besides, and presently he said, Ratty, please. I want to row now. The rat shook his head with a smile. Not yet, my young friend, he said. Wait till you've had a few lessons. Not so easy as it looks. The mole was quiet for a minute or two, but he began to feel more and more jealous of rat, sculling so strongly and so easily along, and his pride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He jumped up and seized the skull so suddenly that the rat, who was gazing out over the water and saying more poetry things to himself, was taken by surprise and fell backwards off his seat with his legs in the air for the second time, 
while the triumphant mole took his place and grabbed the skulls with entire confidence. Stop it, you silly ass, cried the rat from the bottom of the boat. You can't do it. You'll have us over. The mole flung his skulls back with a flourish and made a great dig at the water. He missed the surface altogether. His legs flew up above his head and he found himself lying on top of the prostrate rat. Greatly alarmed, he made a grab at the side of the boat and the next moment, spoof! Over went the boat and he found himself struggling in the river. Oh my, how cold the water was! And oh, how very wet it felt! How it sang in his ears as he went down, down, down! How bright and welcome the sun looked as he rose to the surface, coughing and sputtering! How black was his despair when he felt himself sinking again! Then a firm paw gripped him by the back of his neck. It was the rat, and he was evidently laughing. Mole could feel him laughing, right down his arm and through his paw, and so into his, the mole's neck. The rat got hold of a skull and shoved it under the mole's arm. Then he did the same by the other side of him, and swimming behind, propelled the helpless animal ashore, hauled him out, set him down on the bank, a squashy, pulpy lump of misery. When the rat had rubbed him down a bit and wrung some of the wet out of him, he said, Now then, old fellow, trot up and down the towing path as hard as you can till you're warm and dry again while I dive for the luncheon basket. Oh, the dismal mole, wet without and ashamed within, Potted about till he was fairly dry, while the rat plunged into the water again, recovered the boat, righted her and made her fast, fetched his floating property to shore by degrees, and finally dived successfully for the luncheon basket and struggled to land with it. When all was ready for a start once more, the mole, limp and dejected, took his seat in the stern of the boat, and as they set off, he said, in a low voice, broken with emotion. Ratty, my generous friend, I'm very sorry indeed for my foolish and ungrateful conduct. My heart quite fails me when I think how I might have lost that beautiful luncheon basket. Indeed, I have been a complete ass and I know it. Will you overlook it this once and forgive me and let things go on as before? That's all right. Bless you, responded the rat cheerily. Not a little wet to a water rat. I'm more in the water than out of it most days. Don't you think any more about it? And look here, I really think you'd better come and stop with me for a little time. It's very plain and rough, you know, not like Toad's house at all. But you haven't seen that yet. Still, I can make you comfortable, and I'll teach you to row and to swim and you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us. The mole was so touched by his kind manner of speaking that he could find no voice to answer him, and he had to brush away a tear or two with the back of his paw. The rat kindly looked in another direction, and presently the mole's spirits revived again, and he was able to give some straight back talk to a couple of moorhens who were sniggering to each other about his bedraggled appearance. When they got home, the rat made a bright fire in the parlour and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it, having fetched down a dressing gown and slippers for him, and told him river stories till supper time. Very thrilling stories they were, too. For an earth-dwelling animal like mole. Stories about weirs and sudden floods and leaping pike steamers that flung hard bottles, at least bottles were certainly flung, and from steamers, so presumably by them, and about herons, and how particular they were whom they spoke to, and about adventures down drains and night fishings with otter, or excursions far afield with badger. Supper was a most cheerful meal. Shortly afterwards, terribly sleepy mole had to be escorted upstairs by his considerate host, best bedroom, 
where he soon laid his head on his pillow in great peace and content, knowing that his newfound friend, the river, was lapping the sill of his window. This day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated mole, each of them longer and fuller of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He learned to swim and row and entered into the joy of running water. And with his ear to the reed stems, he caught at intervals something of what the wind went whispering so constantly among them. Chapter 2 The Open Road Ratty, said the mole suddenly one bright summer morning, if you please, I want to ask you a favour. The rat was sitting on the river bank singing a little song. He had just composed it himself, so he was very taken up with it and would not pay proper attention to mole or anything else. Since early morning he had been swimming in the river in company with his friends, the ducks. And when the ducks stood on their heads suddenly, as ducks will, he would dive down and tickle their necks, just under where their chins would be, if ducks had chins, till they were forced to come to the surface again in a hurry, spluttering and angry, shaking their feathers at him. But it is impossible to say quite all you feel when your head is under water. At last, they implored him to go away and attend to his own affairs, and leave them to mind theirs. So the rat went away and sat on the river bank in the sun and made up a song about them, which he called Duck's Ditty. All along the backwater through the rushes tall, ducks are a-dabbling, up tails all. Ducks' tails, drakes' tails, yellow feet a-quiver, yellow bills all out of sight, busy in the river. Slushy green undergrowth where the roach swim, here we keep our larder, cool and full and dim. Everyone for what he likes, we like to be, heads down, tails up, dabbling free. High in the blue above, swift swirl and call, we are down a dabbling, up tails all. I don't know that I think so very much of that little song, Rat, observed the mole, cautiously. He was no poet himself, and didn't care who knew it, and he had a candid nature. Nor don't the ducks neither, replied the rat cheerfully. They say, why can't fellows be allowed to do what they like, when they like, as they like, instead of other fellows sitting on banks and watching them all the time? and making them marks and poetry and things about them. What nonsense it all is. That's what the ducks say. So it is, so it is, said the mole, with great heartiness. No, it isn't, cried the rat indignantly. Well, then, it isn't, it isn't, replied the mole, soothingly. But what I want to ask you was, won't you take me to call on Mr. Toad? I've heard so much about him, and I do so want to make his acquaintance. Why, certainly, said the good-natured rat, jumping to his feet and dismissing poetry from his mind for the day. Get the boat out. We'll paddle up there at once. It's never the wrong time to call on Toad. Early or late, he's always the same fellow, always good-tempered, always glad to see you, always sorry when you go. He must be a very nice animal, observed the mole, as he got into the boat and took the skulls, while the rat settled himself comfortably in the stern. He is indeed the best of animals, replied Rat. So simple, so good-natured, and so affectionate. Perhaps he's not very clever. We can't all be geniuses. And it may be that he's both boastful and, and conceited, but he's got some great qualities, as Toady. Rounding a bend in the river, they came in sight of a handsome, dignified old house of mellow red brick. Well-kept lawns reaching down to the water's edge. There's Toad Hall, said the rat. And that creek on the left, where the notice board says, 
private, no landing allowed, leads to his boathouse, where we leave the boat. The stables are over there, to the right. That's the banqueting hall you're looking at now. Very old, that is. Toad is rather rich, you know. And this is really one of the nicest houses in these parts, though we never admit as much to Toad. They glided up the creek, and the mole shipped his skulls as they passed into the shadow of a large boathouse. Here they saw many handsome boats, slung from the crossbeams or hauled up on a slip, but none in the water, and the place had an unused and deserted air. The rat looked around him. I understand, said he, boating is played out. He's tired of it and done with it. I wonder what new fad he's taken up now. Come along, and let's look him up. We shall hear all about it, it's soon enough. They disembarked, and strolled across the gay, flower-decked lawns in search of Toad, whom they presently happened upon, resting in a wicker garden chair with a preoccupied expression of face and a large map spread out on his knees. Hooray! he cried, jumping up on seeing them. This is splendid! He shook the paws of both of them warmly, never waiting for an introduction to the mole. How kind of you, he went on, dancing round them. I was just going to send a boat down river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once, whatever you were doing. I want you badly, both of you. Now, what'll you take? Come inside and have something. You don't know how lucky it is you're turning up just now. Let's sit quiet a bit, Toady, said the rat, throwing himself into an easy chair while the mole took another by his side of him and made some civil remark about Toad's delightful residence. Finest house on the whole river, cried Toad boisterously. Or anywhere else, for that matter, he could not help adding. Here the rat nudged the mole. Unfortunately, the toad saw him do it, he turned very red. There was a moment's painful silence. Then toad burst out laughing. All right, ratty, he said. It's only my way, you know, and it's not such a very bad house, is it? You know you rather like it yourself. Now, look here. Let's be sensible. You are the very animals I wanted. You've got to help me. It's most important. It's about your rowing, I suppose, said the rat, with an innocent air. You're getting on fairly well, though you splash a good bit still. With a great deal of patience and any quantity of coaching, you may... Oh, poor boating, interrupted the toad in great disgust. Silly boyish amusement. I've given that up long ago. Sheer waste of time, that's what it is. It makes me downright sorry to see you fellows, who ought to know better, spending all your energies in that aimless manner. No, I've discovered the real thing, the only genuine occupation for a lifetime. I propose to devote the remainder of mine to it, and can only regret the wasted years that lie behind me, squandered in trivialities. Come with me, dear Ratty, and your amiable friend also, if you will be so very good, just as far as the stable yard, and you shall see what you shall see. He led the way to the stable yard accordingly, the rat following with a most mistrustful expression. And there, drawn out of the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan shining with newness, painted a canary yellow, picked out with green, and red wheels. There you are, cried the toad, straddling and expanding himself. There's real life for you, embodied in that little cart. The open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling downs, camps, villages, towns, cities, here today, up and off to somewhere else tomorrow, travel, change, interest, excitement, the whole world before you, 
and a horizon that's always changing. And mind, this is the very finest part of its sort that was ever built, without any exception. Come inside and look at the arrangements. And them all myself, I did. The mole was tremendously interested and excited, and followed him eagerly up the steps and into the interior of the caravan. The rat only snorted, thrust his hands deep into his pockets, remaining where he was. It was indeed very compact and comfortable. Little sleeping bunks, a little table that folded up against the wall, a cooking stove, lockers, bookshelves, a bird cage with a bird in it, and pots, pans, jugs and kettles of every size and variety. All complete, said the toad triumphantly, pulling open a locker. You see, biscuits, potted lobster, sardines, everything you can possibly want. Soda water here, backy there, letter paper, bacon, jam, cards and dominoes. You'll find, he continued as they descended the steps again, you'll find that nothing whatever has been forgotten when we make our start this afternoon. I beg your pardon, said the rat slowly as he chewed a straw. Did I overhear you say something about we and start and this afternoon? Now, you dear good old ratty, said Toad imploringly. Don't begin talking in that stiff and sniffy sort of way, because you know you've got to come. I can't possibly manage without you. So please consider it settled and don't argue. It's the one thing I can't stand. You surely don't mean to stick to your dull, fusty old river all your life and just live in a hole in a bank? A boat? I want to show you the world. I'm going to make an animal of you, my boy. I don't care, said the rat doggedly. I'm not coming, and that's flat. And I am going to stick to my old river and live in a hole and boat, as I've always done. And what's more, Mole's going to stick to me and do as I do, aren't you, Mole? Of course I am, said the Mole loyally. I'll always stick to you, Rat. And what you say is to be, has got to be. All the same, it sounds as if it might have been, well, rather fun, you know, he added wistfully. Poor Mole. The life adventurous was so new a thing to him, and so thrilling, and this fresh aspect of it was so tempting, and he had fallen in love at first sight with the canary-coloured cart and all its little fitments. The rat saw what was passing in his mind and wavered. He hated disappointing people, and he was fond of the mole, and would do almost anything to oblige him. Toad was watching both of them closely. Come along in and have some lunch, he said diplomatically, and we'll talk it over. We needn't decide anything in a hurry. Of course, I don't really care. I only want to give pleasure to you fellows. Live for others, that's my motto in life. During luncheon, which was excellent, of course, as everything at Toad Hall always was, the toad simply let himself go. Disregarding the rat, he proceeded to play upon the inexperienced mole as on a harp. Naturally a voluble animal, and always mastered by his imagination, he painted the prospects of the trip and the joys of the open life and the roadside in such glowing colours that the mole could hardly sit in his chair for excitement. Somehow, it soon seemed taken for granted by all three of them that the trip was a settled thing. And the rat, though still unconvinced in his mind, allowed his good nature to override his personal objections. He could not bear to disappoint his two friends, who were already deep in schemes and anticipations, planning out each day's separate occupation for several weeks ahead. When they were quite ready, the now triumphant Toad led his companions to the paddock and set them to capture the old grey horse, who, without having been consulted, 
and to his own extreme annoyance, had been told off by Toad for the dustiest job in this dusty expedition. He frankly preferred the paddock and took a deal of catching. Meantime, Toad packed the lockers still tighter with necessaries and hung nose bags, nets of onions, bundles of hay and baskets from the bottom of the cart. At last the horse was caught and harnessed and they set off, all talking at once, each animal either trudging by the side of the cart or sitting on the shaft as the humour took him. It was a golden afternoon. The smell of the dust they kicked up was rich and satisfying. Out of thick orchards on either side the road, birds called and whistled to them cheerily. Good-natured wayfarers passing them gave them good day or stopped to say nice things about their beautiful cart. And rabbits, sitting at their front doors in the hedgerows, held up their forepaws and said, Oh my, oh my, oh my. Late in the evening, tired and happy and miles from home, they drew up on a remote common far from habitations, turned the horse loose to graze, and ate their simple supper, sitting on the grass by the side of the cart. Toad talked big about all he was going to do in the days to come. The stars grew fuller and larger all around them. The yellow moon, peering suddenly and silently from nowhere in particular, came to keep them company and listen to their talk. At last they turned into their little bunks in the car, and Toad, kicking out his legs, sleepily said, Well, good night, you fellows. This is the real life of a gentleman. <laughs> talk about your old river. I don't talk about my river, patient rat. You know I don't, Toady. Think about it, he added pathetically, in a lower tone. I think about it all the time. The mole reached out from under his blankets, felt for the rat's paw in the darkness and gave it a squeeze. I'll do whatever you like, Ratty, he whispered. Shall we run away tomorrow morning, quite early, very early, and go back to our dear old hole on the river? We'll see it out, whispered back the rat. Thanks awfully, but I ought to stick by the toad till this trip is ended. It wouldn't be safe for him to be left to himself. It won't take very long. His fads never do. The end was indeed nearer than even the rat suspected. After so much open air and excitement, the toad slept very soundly. No amount of shaking could rouse him out of bed next morning. So the mole and rat turned to, quietly and manfully, and while the rat saw to the horse and lit a fire, cleaned last night's cups and platters, got things ready for breakfast, the mole trudged off to the nearest village a long way off, the milk and eggs and various necessaries the toad had, of course, forgotten to provide. The hard work had all been done and the two animals were resting, thoroughly exhausted. By the time Toad appeared on the scene, fresh and gay, remarking what a pleasant, easy life it was they were all leading now, after the cares and worries and fatigues of housekeeping at home. They had a pleasant ramble that day over grassy downs and along narrow by-lanes, and camped, as before, on a common. Only this time the two guests took care that Toad should do his fair share of work. In consequence, when the time came for starting next morning, Toad was by no means so rapturous about the simplicity of the primitive life, and indeed attempted to resume his place in his bunk, whence he was hauled by force. Their way lay, as before, across country by narrow lanes and it was not till the afternoon that they came out on the high road, their first high road. Their disaster, bleak and unforeseen, sprang out on them. Disaster momentous indeed to their expedition, but simply overwhelming 
and its effects on the after career too. They were strolling along the high road easily, the mole by the horse's head talking to him, since the horse had complained that he was being frightfully left out of it, and nobody considered him in the least, the toad and the water rat walking behind the cart, talking together. At least Toad was talking, and Rat was saying at intervals, Yes, precisely. And what did you say to him? And thinking all the time of something very different. And far behind them they heard a faint warning hum, like the drone of a distant bee. Glancing back, they saw a small cloud of dust, the dark centre of energy, advancing on them at incredible speed while from out of the dust a faint hoo-hoo wailed like an uneasy animal in pain. Hardly regarding it, they turned to resume their conversation, when in an instant, as it seemed, the peaceful scene was changed, and with a blast of wind and a whirl of sound that made them jump for the nearest ditch, it was on them. The poop-poop rang with a brazen shout in their ears, they had a moment's glimpse of an interior of glittering plate glass and rich Morocco, and a magnificent motor car, immense, breath-snatching, passionate, with its pilot tense and hugging his wheel, possessed all earth and air for the fraction of a second, flung an enveloping cloud of dust that blinded and enwrapped them utterly, and then dwindled to a speck in the far distance, changed back, into a droning bee once more. The old grey...
Very hoarse, dreaming, as he plodded along of his quiet paddock, in a new raw situation such as this, simply abandoned himself to his natural emotions. Rearing, plunging, backing steadily in spite of all the mole's efforts at his head, and all the mole's lively language directed at his better feelings, he drove the cart backwards towards the deep ditch at the side of the road. It wavered an instant, then there was a heart-rending crash, and the canary-coloured cart, their pride and their joy, lay on its side in the ditch, an irredeemable wreck. The rat danced up and down in the road, simply transported with passion. You villains! he shouted, shaking both fists. You scoundrels, you highwaymen, you, you, you road hogs! I'll have the law on you! I'll report you. I'll take you through all the courts. His homesickness had quite slipped away from him, and for the moment he was the skipper of the canary-coloured vessel, driven on a shoal by the reckless jockeying of rival mariners. And he was trying to recollect 
all the fine and biting things he used to say to masters of steam launches when their wash, as they drove too near the bank, used to flood his parlour carpet at home. Toad sat straight down in the middle of the dusty road, his legs stretched out before him and stared fixedly in the direction of the disappearing motor car. He breathed short, his face wore a placid, satisfied expression, and at intervals he faintly murmured, Poo -poo. The mole was busy trying to quiet the horse, which he succeeded in doing after a time. Then he went to look at the cart on its side in the ditch. It was indeed a sorry sight. Panels and windows smashed, axles hopelessly bent, one wheel off, sardines scattered over the wide world, and the bird in the birdcage sobbing pitifully and calling to be let out. The rat came to help him, but their united efforts were not sufficient to right the cart. Hi, Toad, they cried. Come and bear a hand, can't you? Toad never answered a word or budged from his seat in the road. So they went to see what was the matter with him. They found him in a sort of trance, happy smile on his face. His eyes still fixed on the dusty wake of their destroyer. At intervals, he was still heard to murmur, Ooh, ooh. The rat shook him by the shoulder. Are you coming to help us, Toad? He demanded sternly. Glorious, stirring sight, murmured Toad, never offering to move. The poetry of motion, the real way to travel, the only way to travel, here today, in next week tomorrow, villages skipped, towns and cities jumped, always somebody else's horizon. Oh, bliss. Oh, poop, poop. Oh, my, oh, my. Oh, stop being an ass, Toad, cried the mole despairingly. And to think I never knew, went on Toad in a dreamy monotone. All those wasted years that lie behind me. I never knew, I never even dreamt, but now, but now that I know, now that I've fully realised, oh, what a flowery track lies spread before me henceforth. What dust clouds shall spring up behind me as I speed on my reckless way? What carts I shall fling carelessly into the ditch in the wake of my magnificent onset? Horrid little carts, common carts, canary-coloured carts. What are we to do with him? asked the mole of the water rat. Nothing at all, replied the rat firmly, because there is really nothing to be done. You see, I know him from old. He is now possessed. He's got a new craze, and it always takes him that way in its first stage. He'll continue like that for days now, like an animal walking in a happy dream. Quite useless for all practical purposes. Never mind him. Let's go and see what there is to be done about the cart. A careful inspection showed them that even if they succeeded in writing it by themselves, the cart would travel no longer. The axles were in a hopeless state, and the missing wheel was shattered into pieces. The rat knotted the horse's reins over his back and took him by the head, carrying the bird cage and its hysterical occupant in the other hand. Come on, he said grimly to the mole. It's five or six miles to the nearest town and we shall just have to walk it. The sooner we make a start, the better. But what about Toad? asked the mole anxiously as they set off together. We can't leave him here, sitting in the middle of the road by himself, in the distracted state he's in. It's not safe, supposing another thing were to come along. Oh, bother, Toad, said the rat savagely. I've done with him. They had not proceeded very far on their way, however, when there was a pattering of feet behind them, and Toad caught them up and thrust a paw inside the elbow of each of them 
still breathing short and staring into vacancy. Now look here, Toad, said the rat sharply. As soon as we get to the town, you will have to go straight to the police station and see if they know anything about the motor car and who it belongs to and lodge a complaint against it. And then you'll have to go to a blacksmith's or a wheelwright's and arrange for the cart to be fetched and mended and put to rights. It'll take time, but it's not quite a hopeless smash. Meanwhile, the mole and I will go to an inn and find comfortable rooms where we can stay till the cart's ready, until your nerves have recovered their shock. Police station, complaint, murmured Toad dreamily. Me complain of that beautiful, that heavenly vision that has been vouchsafed me. Men, the car. I've done with carts forever. I never want to see the cart or to hear of it again. Oh, Ratty, you can't think how obliged I am to you for consenting to come on this trip. I couldn't have gone without you. And then I might never have seen that, that swan. That sunbeam, that thunderbolt. I might never have heard that entrancing sound or smelt that bewitching smell. I owe it all to you, my best of friends. The rat turned away from him in despair. You see what it is, he said to the mole, addressing him across Toad's head. He's quite hopeless. I give it up. When we get to the town, we'll go to the railway station, and with luck we may pick up a train there that'll get us back to the river bank tonight. And if ever you catch me going a-pleasuring with this provoking animal again... <laughs> he snorted, and during the rest of that weary trudge, addressed his remarks exclusively to Mo. On reaching the town, they went straight to the station and deposited Toad in the second-class waiting room giving a porter tuppence to keep a strict eye on him. They then left the horse at an inn stable and gave what instructions they could about the cart at its contents. Eventually, a slow train, having landed them at a station not very far from Toad Hall, they escorted the spellbound, sleepwalking Toad to his door, put him inside it, and instructed his housekeeper to feed him, undress him, and put him to bed. Then they got out their boat from the boathouse, sculled down the river home, and at a very late hour sat down to supper in their own cosy riverside parlour, to the rat's great joy and contentment. The following evening the mole, who had risen late and taken things very easy all day, was sitting on the bank fishing, when the rat, who had been looking up his friends and gossiping, came strolling along to find him. Heard the news, he said. There's nothing else being talked about all along the river bank. Toad went up to town by an early train this morning, and he has ordered a large and very expensive motor car. Chapter 3 The Wild Wood. The mole had long waited to make the acquaintance of the badger. He seemed, by all accounts, to be such an important personage and though rarely visible, to make his unseen influence felt by everybody about the place. But whenever the mole mentioned his wish to the water rat, he always found himself put off. It's all right, the rat would say. Badger will turn up some day or other. He's always turning up. And then I'll introduce you. The best of fellows. But you must not only take him as you find him, but when you find him. Couldn't you ask him here dinner or something, said the mole. He wouldn't come, replied the rat simply. Badger hates society and invitations and dinner and all that sort of thing. Well then, supposing we go and call on him, suggested the mole. Oh, I'm sure you wouldn't like that at all, said the rat, quite alarmed. He's so very shy, he'd be sure to be offended. I've never even ventured to call on him at his own home myself though I know him so well. Besides, we can't. It's quite out of the question, because he lives in the very middle of the wild wood. Well, supposing he does, said the mole. You told me the wild wood was all right, you know. 
Oh, I know, I know, so it is, replied the rat evasively. But I think we won't go there just now, not just yet. It's a long way, and you wouldn't be at home at this time of the year, anyhow. And you'll be coming along some day now, if you'll wait quietly. The mole had to be content with this, but the badger never came along, and every day brought its amusements, and it was not till summer was long over, and cold and frost and miry ways kept them much indoors, and the swollen river raced past outside their windows with a speed that mocked at boating of any sort or kind, that he found his thoughts dwelling again with much persistence on the solitary grey badger who lived his own life by himself in his hole in the middle of the wild wood. In the wintertime the rats slept a great deal, retiring early and rising late. During his short day he sometimes scribbled poetry or did other small domestic jobs about the house. And of course there were always animals dropping in for a chat. And consequently, there was a good deal of storytelling and comparing notes on the past summer and all its doings. Such a rich chapter it had been, when one came to look back on it all. There were illustrations so numerous and so very highly coloured. The pageant of the river bank had marched steadily along, unfolding itself in scene pictures that succeeded each other in stately procession. Purple loosestrife arrived early, shaking luxuriant, tangled locks along the edge of the mirror, whence his own face laughed back at it. Willow herb, tender and wistful, like a pink sunset cloud, was not slow to follow. Comfrey, the purple hand in hand with the white, crept forth to take its place in the line, and at last one morning the diffident and delaying dog rose, stepped delicately on the stage, and one knew, as if string music had announced it in stately chords that strayed into a gavotte, that June at last was here. One member of the company was still awaited, the shepherd boy with the nymphs to woo, the knight for whom the ladies waited at the window, prince that was to kiss the sleeping summer back to life and love. But when meadow-sweet, debonair and odorous in amber jerkin moved graciously to his place in the group, then the play was ready to begin. And what a play it had been! Drowsy animals snug in their holes while wind and rain were battering at their doors recalled still keen mornings an hour before sunrise when the white mist, as yet undispersed, clung closely along the surface of the water. Then the shock of the early plunge, the scamper along the bank, and the radiant transformation of earth, air and water, when suddenly the sun was with them again, and grey was gold and colour was born and sprang out of the earth once more. They recalled the languorous siesta of hot midday, deep in green undergrowth, the sun striking through in tiny golden shafts and spots, the boating and bathing of the afternoon, the rambles along dusty lanes and through yellow cornfields, and the long, cool evening at last, when so many threads were gathered up, so many friendships rounded, so many adventures planned for the morrow. There was plenty to talk about on those short, winter days when the animals found themselves round the fire. Still, the mole had a good deal of spare time on his hands, and so one afternoon, when the rat in his armchair before the blaze was alternately dozing and trying over rhymes that wouldn't fit, he formed the resolution to go out by himself and explore the wild wood, and perhaps strike up an acquaintance with Mr. Badger. It was a cold, still afternoon with a hard, steely sky overhead when he slipped out of the warm parlour into the open air. The country lay bare and entirely leafless around him, and he thought he'd never seen so far 
and so intimately into the inside of things, as on that winter day when nature was deep in her annual slumber and seemed to have kicked the clothes off. Copses, dells, quarries, and all hidden places, which had been mysterious mines for exploration in leafy summer, now exposed themselves and their secrets pathetically, and seemed to ask him to overlook their shabby poverty for a while. So they could riot in rich masquerade as before, and trick and entice him with the old deceptions. It was pitiful in a way, and yet cheering, even exhilarating. He was glad that he liked the country undecorated, hard, and stripped of its finery. He had got down to the bare bones of it, and they were fine and strong and simple. He did not want the warm clover and the play of seeding grasses. The screens of quickset, the billowy drapery of beech and elm, seemed best away. And with great cheerfulness of spirit, he pushed on towards the wild wood, which lay before him, low and threatening, like a black reef in some still southern sea. There was nothing to alarm him at first entry. Twigs crackled under his feet, logs tripped him, funguses on stumps resembled caricatures, and startled him for a moment by their likeness to something familiar and far away. But that was all fun and exciting. It led him on, and he penetrated to where the light was less, and trees crouched nearer and nearer, and holes made ugly mouths at him on either side. Everything was very still now. The dusk advanced on him steadily, rapidly, gathering in behind and before, and the light seemed to be draining away like flood water. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder, and indistinctly, that he first thought he saw a face a little, evil, wedge-shaped face, looking out at him from a hole. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. He quickened his pace, telling himself cheerfully not to begin imagining things, or there would be simply no end to it. He passed another hole, and another, and another, and then, yes, no, yes, certainly, a little narrow face with hard eyes had flashed up for an instant from a hole and was gone. He hesitated, braced himself up for an effort and strode on. Then suddenly, as if it had been so all the time, every hole, far and near, and there were hundreds of them, seemed to possess its face coming and going rapidly, all fixing on him glances of malice and hatred, all hard-eyed and evil and sharp. If he could only get away from the holes in the banks, he thought, there would be no more faces. He swung off the path and plunged into the untrodden places of the wood. Then the whistling began. Very faint and shrill it was, and far behind him, when first he heard it. Somehow it made him hurry forward. Then still very faint and shrill, it sounded far ahead of him, and made him hesitate and want to go back. As he halted in indecision, it broke out on either side, and seemed to be caught up and passed on through the whole length of the wood to its furthest limit. They were up and alert and ready, evidently, whoever they were. And he, he was alone and unarmed and far from any help, and the night was closing in. Then the pattering began. He thought it was only falling leaves at first, so slight and delicate was the sound of it. 
and as it grew, it took a regular rhythm, and you knew it for nothing else but the pat, pat, pat of little feet. Still a very long way off. Was it in front or behind? It seemed to be first one, then the other, then both. It grew and it multiplied till from every quarter as he listened anxiously, leaning this way and that, it seemed to be closing in on him. As he stood still to hearken, a rabbit came running hard towards him through the trees. He waited, expecting it to slacken pace or to swerve from him into a different course. Instead, the animal almost touched him as it dashed past, his face set and hard, his eyes staring. Get out of this, you fool! Get out! Mo heard him mutter as he swung round a stump and disappeared down a friendly burrow. The pattering increased till it sounded like sudden hail on the dry leaf carpet spread around him. The whole wood seemed running now, running hard, hunting, chasing, closing in round something or somebody. In panic he began to run too, aimlessly, he knew not whither. He ran up against things, he fell over things and into things, he darted under things and dodged round things. At last he took refuge in the dark, deep hollow of an old beech tree, which offered shelter, concealment, perhaps even safety, but who could tell? Anyhow, he was too tired to run any further, and could only snuggle down into the dry leaves which had drifted into the hollow, and hope he was safe for the time. And as he lay there, panting and trembling, and listened to the whistlings and the pattering outside, he knew it at last, in all its fullness, that dread thing which other little dwellers in field and hedgerow had encountered here, and known as their darkest moment, that thing which the rat had vainly tried to shield him from, the terror of the wild wood. Meantime, the rat, warm and comfortable, dozed by his fireside. His paper of half-finished verses slipped from his knee, his head fell back, his mouth opened, and he wandered by the verdant banks of dream rivers. Then a coal slipped. The fire crackled and sent up a spurt of flame, and he woke with a start. Remembering what he had been engaged upon, he reached down to the floor for his verses, pored over them for a minute, and then looked round for the mole to ask him if he knew a good rhyme or something or other. The mole was not there. He listened for a time. The house seemed very quiet. Then he called, Molly, several times, and receiving no answer, got up and went out into the hall. The mole's cap was missing from its accustomed peg. His galoshes, which always lay by the umbrella stand, were also gone. The rat left the house and carefully examined the muddy surface of the ground outside, hoping to find the mole's tracks. There they were, sure enough. The galoshes were new, just bought for the winter and the pimples on their soles were fresh and sharp. He could see the imprints of them in the mud, running along straight and purposeful, leading direct to the wild wood. The rat looked very grave and stood in deep thought for a minute or two. Then he re-entered the house, strapped a belt around his waist, shoved a brace of pistols into it, took up a stout cudgel that stood in a corner of the hall and set off for the wild wood at a smart pace. It was already getting towards dusk when he reached the first fringe of trees and plunged without hesitation into the wood, looking anxiously on either side for any sign of his friend. Here and there wicked little faces popped out of holes, but vanished immediately at sight of the valorous animal, his pistols and the great ugly cudgel in his grasp, and the whistling 
and pattering, which he had heard quite plainly on his first entry, died away and ceased, and all was very still. He made his way manfully through the length of the wood to its furthest edge. Then, forsaking all paths, he set himself to traverse it, laboriously working over the whole ground, and all the time calling out cheerfully, Molly, 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 where are you? It's me, it's old rat. He had patiently hunted through the wood for an hour or more, when at last, to his joy, he heard a little answering cry. Guiding himself by the sound, he made his way through the gathering darkness to the foot of an old beech tree with a hole in it, and from out of the hole came a feeble voice saying, Ratty, is that really you? The rat crept into the hollow, and there he found the mole, exhausted and still trembling. Oh, rat, he cried. I've been so frightened, you can't think. Oh, I quite understand, said the rat soothingly. You shouldn't really have gone and done it, Mole. I did my best to keep you from it. We river bankers, we hardly ever come here by ourselves. If we have to come, we come in couples at least. Then we're generally all right. Besides, there are a hundred things one has to know, which we understand all about, and you don't, as yet. I mean, passwords, signs, and sayings which have power and effect, and plants you can carry in your pocket, and verses you repeat, and dodges and tricks you practice. All simple enough when you know them, but they've got to be known if you're small, or you'll find yourself in trouble. Of course, if you're a badger or otter, it'll be quite another matter. Surely the brave Mr. Toad wouldn't mind coming here by himself, would he? inquired the mole. Oh, Toad, said the rat, laughing heartily, he wouldn't show his face here alone. Not for a whole hatful of golden guineas, Toad wouldn't. The mole was greatly cheered by the sound of the rat's careless laughter, as well as by the sight of his stick and his gleaming pistols, and he stopped shivering and began to feel bolder and more himself again. Now then, said the rat presently, we really must pull ourselves together and make a start for home while there's still a little light left. It'll never do to spend the night here, you understand. Too cold, for one thing. Dear Ratty, said the poor mole, I'm dreadfully sorry, but I'm simply dead beaked, and that's a solid fact. You must let me rest here a while longer and get my strength back, if I am to get home at all. Oh, all right, said the good-natured rat. Rest away. It's pretty nearly pitch dark now, anyhow, and there ought to be a bit of a moon later. So the mole got well into the dry leaves and stretched himself out and presently dropped off into sleep, though a broken and troubled sort. While the rat covered himself up, too, as best he might, for warmth, and lay patiently waiting with a pistol in his paw. When at last the mole woke up much refreshed, and in his usual spirits, the rat said, Now then, I'll just take a look outside and see if everything's quiet, and then we really must be off. He went to the entrance of their retreat and put his head out, then the mole heard him say quietly to himself, Hello, hello, here is a go. What's up, Ratty? asked the mole. Snow is up, replied the rat briefly, or rather down. It's snowing hard. The mole came and crouched beside him, and looking out, saw the wood that had been so dreadful to him in quite a changed aspect. Holes, hollows, pools, pitfalls, and other black menaces to the wayfarer were vanishing fast, and a gleaming carpet of fairy was springing up everywhere that looked too delicate to be trodden upon by rough feet. 
A fine powder filled the air and caressed the cheek with a tingle in its touch. And the black holes of the trees showed up in the light that seemed to come from below. Well, well, it can't be helped, said the rat after pondering. We must make a start and take our chance, I suppose. The worst of it is I don't exactly know where we are, and this snow makes everything look so very different. It did indeed. The mole would not have known that it was the same wood. However, they set out bravely and took the line that seemed most promising, holding on to each other and pretending with invincible cheerfulness that they recognised an old friend in every fresh tree that grimly and silently greeted them, or saw openings, gaps or paths with a familiar turn in them, in the monotony of white space and black tree trunks that refused to vary. An hour or two later they had lost all count of time. They pulled up, dispirited, weary, and hopelessly at sea, and sat down on a fallen tree trunk to recover their breath and consider what was to be done. They were aching with fatigue and bruised with tumbles. They had fallen into several holes and got wet through. The snow was getting so deep that they could hardly drag their little legs through it and the trees were thicker and more like each other than ever. There seemed to be no end to this wood, and no beginning, and no difference in it, and worst of all, no way out. We can't sit here very long, said the rat. We shall have to make another push for it and do something or other. Cold is too awful for anything, and the snow will soon be too deep for us to wade through. He peered about him and considered. Look here, he went on. This is what occurs to me. There's a sort of dell down there in front of us, where the ground seems all hilly and humpy and hummocky. We'll make our way down into that and try and find some sort of shelter, cave or hole with a dry floor to it, out of the snow and the wind. And there we'll have a good rest before we try again. We are both of us pretty deadbeat. Besides, the snow may leave off, or something may turn up. So once more they got on their feet and struggled down into the dell, where they hunted about for a cave or some corner that was dry and protection from the keen wind and the whirling snow. They were investigating one of the hummocky bits the rat had spoken of, when suddenly the mole tripped up and fell forward on his face with a squeal. Oh, my leg, he cried. Oh, my poor shin. And he sat up on the snow and nursed his leg in both his front paws. Poor old mole, said the rat kindly. You don't seem to be having much luck today, do you? Let's have a look at the leg. Yes, he went on, going down on his knees to look. You've cut your shin, sure enough. Wait till I get my handkerchief, and I'll tie it up for you. I must have tripped over a hidden branch or a stump, said the mole miserably. Oh, my, oh, my. It's a very clean cut, said the rat, examining it again attentively. That was never done by a branch or a stump. It looks as if it was made by a sharp edge of something in metal. Eh? He pondered a while and examined the humps and slopes that surrounded them. Well, never mind what done it, said the mole, forgetting his grammar in his pain. It hurts just the same, whatever done it. But the rat, after carefully tying up the leg with his handkerchief, had left him and was busy scraping in the snow. He scratched and shoveled and explored, all four legs working busily, while the mole waited impatiently, remarking at intervals, Oh, come on, rat! Suddenly the rat cried, Hooray! And then, Hooray, 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 and fell to executing a feeble jig in the snow. What have you found, ratty? asked the mole, still nursing his leg. 
Come and see, said the delighted rat as he jigged on. The mole hobbled up to the spot and had a good look. Well, he said at last, slowly, I see it right enough. Seen the same sort of thing before, lots of times. Familiar object, I call it. A door scraper. Well, what of it? Why dance jigs around a door scraper? But don't you see what it means, you, you dull-witted animal? cried the rat impatiently. Of course I see what it means, replied the mole. Simply means that some very careless and forgetful person has left his door scraper lying about in the middle of the wild wood, just where it's sure to trip everybody up. Very thoughtless of him, I call it. When I get home, I shall go and complain about it to... to somebody or other, see if I don't. Oh, dear, oh, dear, cried the rat in despair at his obtuseness. Here, stop arguing and come and scrape. And he set to work again, and made the snow fly in all directions around him. After some further toil, his efforts were rewarded, and a very shabby doormat lay exposed to view. There, what did I tell you? exclaimed the rat in great triumph. Absolutely nothing whatever, replied the mole with perfect truthfulness. Well now, he went on, you seem to have found another piece of domestic litter, done for and thrown away, and I suppose you're perfectly happy. Better go ahead and dance your jig round that, if you've got to, and get it over, and then perhaps we can go on and not waste any more time over rubbish heaps. Can we eat a doormat, or sleep under a doormat, or sit on a doormat and sledge home over the snow on it, you exasperating rodent? Do you mean to say, cried the excited rat, that this doormat doesn't tell you anything? Really, rat, said the mole quite pettishly, I think we've had enough of this folly. Who ever heard of a doormat telling anyone anything? They simply don't do it. They're not that sort at all. Doormats know their place. Now look here, you, you thick-headed beast, replied the rat, really angry. This must stop. Not another word, but scrape. Scrape and scratch and dig and hunt round, especially on the sides of the hummocks. If you want to sleep dry and warm tonight, for it's our last chance. The rat attacked a snowbank beside them with ardour, probing with his cudgel everywhere and then digging with fury. And then the mole scraped busily too more to oblige the rat than for any other reason, for his opinion was that his friend was getting light-headed. Some ten minutes' hard work, and the point of the rat's cudgel struck something that sounded hollow. He worked till he could get a paw through and feel, then called the mole to come and help him. Hard at it went the two animals, till at last the result of their labours stood full in view of the astonished and hitherto incredulous mole. In the side of what seemed to be a snowbank stood a solid-looking little door, painted a dark green, an iron bell pull hung by the side, and below it, on a small brass plate, neatly engraved in square capital letters, they could read by the aid of moonlight, Mr. Badger. The mole fell backwards on the snow from sheer surprise and delight. Rat, he cried in penitence, you're a wonder, a real wonder, that's what you are. I see it all now. You argued it out step by step in that wise head of yours. From the very moment that I fell and cut my shin and you looked at the cut and at once your majestic mind said to itself, door scraper. And then you turned to and found the very door scraper that done it. Did you stop there? No. Some people would have been quite satisfied, but not you. Your intellect went on working. Let me only just find the door mat, says you to yourself. And my theory is proved. And of course you found your door mat. You're so clever. I believe you could find anything you liked. 
now, says you, that door exists as plain as if I saw it. There's nothing else remains to be done but to find it. Well, I've read about that sort of thing in books, but I've never come across it before in real life. You ought to go away, you'll be properly appreciated. You're simply wasted here among us fellows. If I only had your head, Ratty. But as you haven't interrupted the rat rather unkindly, I suppose you're going to sit on the snow all night and talk. Get up at once and hang on to that bell pull you see there and ring hard, as hard as you can, while I hammer. While the rat attacked the door with his stick, the mole sprang up at the doorbell, touched it and swung there, both feet well off the ground, and from quite a long way off, they could faintly hear a deep-toned bell respond. Chapter 4 Mr. Badger They waited patiently for what seemed a very long time, stamping in the snow to keep their feet warm. At last they heard the sound of slow, shuffling footsteps approaching the door from the inside. It seemed... As the mole remarked to the rat, like someone walking in carpet slippers that were too large for him and down at heel, which was intelligent of mole, because that was exactly what it was. There was the noise of a bolt shot back, and the door opened a few inches, enough to show a long snout and a pair of sleepy, blinking eyes. Now, the very next time this happens said a gruff and suspicious voice. I shall be exceedingly angry. Who is it this time? Disturbing people on such a night? Speak up! Oh, Badger, cried the rat. Let us in, please. It's me, Rat, and my friend, Mole, and we've lost our way in the snow. What? Ratty, my dear little man, exclaimed the Badger in quite a different voice. Come along in, both of you, at once. Why, you must be perished. Well, I never. Lost in the snow. And in the wild wood, too. At this time of night. But come in with you. The two animals tumbled over each other in their eagerness to get inside and heard the door shut behind them with great joy and relief. The badger, who wore a long dressing gown and whose slippers were indeed very down at heel, carried a flat candlestick in his paw, and had probably been on his way to bed when their summons sounded. He looked kindly down on them and patted both their heads. This is not the sort of night for small animals to be out, he said paternally. I'm afraid you've been up to some of your pranks again, Ratty. But come along. Come into the kitchen. There's a first-rate fire there and supper and everything. He shuffled on in front of them, carrying the light, and they followed him, nudging each other in an anticipating sort of way, down a long, gloomy, and to tell the truth, decidedly shabby passage, into a sort of central hall, out of which they could dimly see other long, tunnel-like passages branching, passages mysterious and without apparent end. But there were doors in the hall as well, stout oaken, comfortable-looking doors, one of these the badger flung open, and at once they found themselves in all the glow and warmth of a large, firelit kitchen. The floor was well-worn red brick, and on the wide hearth burnt a fire of logs between two attractive chimney corners tucked away in the wall, well out of any suspicion of draught. A couple of high-backed settles, facing each other on either side of the fire, gave further sitting accommodation for the sociably disposed. In the middle of the room stood a long table of plain boards placed on trestles with benches down each side. At one end of it, where an armchair stood pushed back, were spread the remains of the badger's plain but ample supper. Rows of spotless plates winked from the shelves of the dresser at the far end of the room, and from the rafters overhead hung hands, Bundles of dried herbs, nets of onions, and baskets of eggs. It seemed a place where heroes could fitly feast after victory, where weary harvesters could line up in scores along the table 
and keep their harvest home with mirth and song. Or where two or three friends of simple taste could sit about as they pleased and eat and smoke and talk in comfort and contentment. The ruddy brick floor smiled up at the smoky ceiling. The oaken settles, shiny with long wear, exchanged cheerful glances with each other. Plates on the dresser grinned at the pots on the shelf, and the merry firelight flickered and played over everything without distinction. The kindly badger thrust them down on a settle to toast themselves at the fire and bade them remove their wet coats and boots. Then he fetched them dressing gowns and slippers and himself bathed the mole's shin with warm water and mended the cut with sticking plaster till the whole thing was just as good as new, if not better. In the embracing light and warmth, warm and dry at last, with weary legs propped up in front of them, and a suggestive clink of plates being arranged on the table behind. It seemed to the storm-driven animals, now in safe anchorage, that the cold and trackless wild wood just left outside was miles and miles away, and all that they had suffered in it, half-forgotten dream. When at last they were thoroughly toasted, the badger summoned them to the table, where he had been busy laying a repast. They had felt pretty hungry before, but when they actually saw at last the supper that was spread for them, really it seemed only a question of what they should attack first, where all was so attractive, and whether the other things would obligingly wait for them till they had the time to give them attention. Conversation was impossible for a long time, and when it was slowly resumed, it was that regrettable sort of conversation that results from talking with your mouth full. The badger did not mind that sort of thing at all, nor did he take any notice of elbows on the table, or everybody speaking at once. As he did not go into society himself, he had got an idea that these things belonged to the things that really didn't matter. We know, of course, that he was wrong, and took too narrow a view, because they do matter very much though it would take too long to explain why. He sat in his armchair at the head of the table and nodded gravely at intervals as the animals told their story. And he did not seem surprised or shocked at anything, and he never said, I told you so, or just what I always said, or remarked that they ought to have done so and so, or ought not to have done something else, the mole began to feel very friendly towards him. When supper was really finished at last, and each animal felt that his skin was now as tight as was decently safe, and that by this time he didn't care a hang for anybody or anything, they gathered round the glowing embers of the great wood fire and thought how jolly it was to be sitting up so late and so independent and so full. And after they had chatted for a time about things in general, the badger said heartily, Now then, tell us the news from your part of the world. How's old Toad going on? Oh, from bad to worse, said the rat gravely, while the mole, cocked up on a settle and basking in the firelight, his heels higher than his head, tried to look properly mournful. Another smash-up only last week, and a bad one, you see, he will insist on driving himself, and he's hopelessly incapable. If he'd only employ a decent, steady, well-trained animal, pay him good wages, and leave everything to him, he'd get on all right. But no, he's convinced he's a heaven-born driver, and nobody can teach him anything, and all the rest follows. How many has he had? inquired the badger gloomily. "'Smashes or machines?' asked the rat. Oh, "'Well, after all, it's the same thing with Toad. "'This is the seventh. "'As for the others, you know that coach-house of his? "'Well, it's piled up, literally piled up to the roof, "'with fragments of motor-cars, none of them bigger than your hat. "'That accounts for the other six, so far as they can be accounted for. "'He's been in hospital three times,' put in the mole, and as for the fines he's had to pay, it's simply awful to think of. 
Yes, and that's part of the trouble, continued the rat. Toad's rich, we all know, and he's not a millionaire. And he's a hopelessly bad driver and quite regardless of law and order. Killed or ruined, it's got to be one of the two things, sooner or later. Badger, we're his friends. Oughtn't we to do something? The badger went through a bit of hard thinking. No, look here, he said at last, rather severely. Of course you know. I can't do anything now. His two friends assented, quite understanding his point. No animal, according to the rules of animal etiquette, is ever expected to do anything strenuous or heroic, or even moderately active, during the off-season of winter. All are sleepy, some actually asleep. All are weather-bound, more or less, and all are resting from arduous days and nights, during which every muscle in them has been severely tested and every energy kept at full stretch. Very well, then, continued the badger. But when once the year has really turned and the nights are shorter, and halfway through them one rouses and feels fidgety, and wanting to be up and doing by sunrise, if not that I knew now, both animals nodded gravely. They knew. Well, then, went on the badger, we... That is, you and me and our friend, the Mole, here. We'll take Toad seriously in hand. We'll stand no nonsense whatever. We'll bring him back to reason by force, if need be. We'll make him a sensible Toad. We'll... You're asleep, Rat. Not me, said the Rat, waking up with a jerk. He's been asleep two or three times since supper said the mole, laughing. He himself was feeling quite wakeful, and even lively, though he didn't know why. The reason was, of course, that he being naturally an underground animal by birth and breeding, the situation of Badger's house exactly suited him, and made him feel at home. While the rat, who slept every night in a bedroom, the windows of which opened on a breezy river, naturally felt the atmosphere still and oppressive. Well, it's time we were all in bed said the badger, getting up and fetching flat candlesticks. Come along, you two, and I'll show you your chorus. Take your time tomorrow morning, breakfast at any hour you please. He conducted the two animals to a long room that seemed half bedchamber and half loft. The badger's winter stores, which indeed were visible everywhere, took up half the room. Piles of apples, turnips and potatoes, baskets full of nuts, and jars of honey. But the two little white beds on the remainder of the floor looked soft and inviting, and the linen on them, though coarse, was clean and smelt beautifully of lavender. And the mole and the water rat, shaking off their garments in some thirty seconds, tumbled in between the sheets in great joy and contentment. In accordance with the kindly badger's injunctions, the two tired animals came down to breakfast very late next morning and found a bright fire burning in the kitchen and two young hedgehogs sitting on a bench at the table eating oatmeal porridge out of wooden bowls. The hedgehogs dropped their spoons, rose to their feet and ducked their heads respectfully as the two entered. "'There, yeah, sit down, sit down,' said the rat pleasantly. and "'Go on with your porridge. "'Where have you youngsters come from?' "'Lost your way in the snow, I suppose?' "'Yes, please, sir,' said the elder of the two hedgehogs respectfully. "'Me and little Billy here, and we was trying to find our way to school. "'Mother would have us go, was the weather ever so. "'And, of course, we lost ourselves, sir, "'and Billy he got frightened and took and cried, being young and faint-hearted. "'And at last we happened up against Mr. Badger's back door, "'and made so bold as to knock, sir.' Mr. Badger, he's a kind-hearted gentleman, as everyone knows. I understand, said the rat, cutting himself some rashers from a side of bacon, while the mole dropped some eggs into a saucepan. And what's the weather like outside? You needn't sir me quite so much, he added. Oh, terrible bad, sir. Terrible deep the snow is, said the hedgehog. No getting out for the likes of you gentlemen today. "'Where's Mr. Badger?' inquired the mole, 
as she warmed the coffee pot before the fire. The master's gone into his study, sir, replied the hedgehog, and he said as how he was going to be particular busy this morning, and on no account was he to be disturbed. This explanation, of course, was thoroughly understood by everyone present. The fact is, as already set forth, when you live a life of intense activity for six months in the year, and of comparative or actual somnolence for the other six, during the latter period you cannot be continually pleading sleepiness when there are people about or things to be done. The excuse gets monotonous. The animals well knew that Badger, having eaten a hearty breakfast, had retired to his study and settled himself in an armchair with his legs up on another and a red cotton handkerchief over his face and was being busy in the usual way at this time of the year. The front doorbell clanged loudly and the rat who was very greasy with buttered toast sent Billy the smaller hedgehog to see who it might be. There was a sound of much stamping in the hall and Presently Billy returned in front of the otter, who threw himself on the rat with an embrace and a shout of affectionate greeting. "'Get off!' spluttered the rat with his mouth full. "'Thought I should find you here all right,' said the otter cheerfully. "'They were all in a great state of alarm along the river bank when I arrived this morning. Rat never been home all night, nor mole either. Something dreadful must have happened,' they said. "'And the snow had covered up all your tracks, of course.' But I knew that when people were in any fix, they mostly went to Badger, or else Badger got to know of it somehow. So I came straight off here, through the wild wood and the snow. My, it was fine, coming through the snow as the red sun was rising and showing against the black tree trunks. As you went along in the stillness, every now and then masses of snow slid off the branches suddenly with a flop making you jump and run for cover. Snow castles and snow caverns had sprung up out of nowhere in the night. And snow bridges, terraces, ramparts, I could have stayed and played with them for hours. Here and there great branches had been torn away by the sheer weight of the snow, and robins perched and hopped on them in their perky, conceited way, just as if they'd done it themselves. A ragged string of wild geese passed overhead, high on the grey sky, and a few rooks whirled over the trees, inspected and flapped off homewards with a disgusted expression. But I met no sensible being to ask the news of. About halfway across I came on a rabbit sitting on a stump, cleaning his silly face with his paws. He was a pretty scared animal, and I crept up behind him and placed a heavy forepaw on his shoulder. I had to cuff his head once or twice to get any sense out of it at all. Last I managed to extract from him that Mole had been seen in the wild wood last night by one of them. It was the talk of the burrows, he said. Our Mole, Mr. Rat's particular friend, was in a bad fix. How he had lost his way. And they were up and out hunting and were chiving him round and round. Then why didn't any of you do something, I asked. You may be blessed with brains, but there are hundreds and hundreds of you, big stout fellows as fat as butter, and your burrows running in all directions, and you could have taken him in, made him safe and comfortable, or tried to at all events. What us, he merely said, do something, us rabbits.